So um, for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Louise Arnold. I'm a haematology nurse um, and I'm trained to be an advanced clinical practitioner, but still very much part of the PNH team at Leeds um, Teaching Hospitals. Um, I've been working there for 21 years today, I've just realised, so that's um, shocked me a little bit. I only came for a year and I've been stuck in the north ever, ever since. But I do love Yorkshire, so it's OK. So um, I've been asked to, to speak about meningitis and PNH today um, and the experience we've had that. I, I'm really excited as well because it's, it's a slightly different session because I'm also going to be joined by one of um, the patients that has kindly offered to share her experience with meningitis as well, which I think is exceptional and very brave. And I'm very in order to be able to offer that today. It's amazing. But what I thought I'd start with is a little bit of um, just chat around it and why meningitis is something that we are interested in in PNH and why we bring it to. But the main thing that I emphasise from this, although you'll hear the experience from Jovi, that um, it is something that is possible, but it's not a thing that we see massively. It's just something to be aware of. And I think I don't want to see it in any other way than just increasing awareness and understanding. So um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Sorry, we've had real IT issues this morning. Apart from all being called Maria, I can't get my <laughs> laptop and things to work either this morning. So my aim of the session um, is to talk about why it is important, as I've just said, and why it's significant in PNH, understand the risk a little bit more in the management of it, share the experience of Jovi, and, and then answer any questions you have. And as Maria said at the beginning, just um, pop them in the chat, or we can have a little bit of Q&A at the end. I don't want it to be me lecturing because it's just an understanding really. I put up the the the, the, the picture there where um, there are different causes and different ways that meningitis can come about and that's a generic kind of thing from meningitis now not just in PNH. In PNH we very much see a bacterial cause of meningitis rather than the viral cause and it, that's not significant in the sense of understanding it's just more about how we would um, react to that and treat it and it can just be a little bit something that we need to react to quickly if it were to happen if we go to the next slide please sorry so i think everybody on here doesn't need me to go into too much detail today about pnh and if i had more time i would talk about it a little bit more but i thought i'd just give us a little bit of background and I picked out that we all know it's a rare disease, which then um, when, when we come to managing something that happens within a rare disease, that's where the onus very much comes to the people that have the rare disease and to be the expert in that. But it's sharing that responsibility with the people that do know you, but on also if it was an acute situation, such as an infection or sepsis, that you know how to get that information across. And I think that is very, very vital in my experience. We diagnose PNH, as you know, with a simple blood test, but the diagnosis is not simple in itself because it takes time for someone to have suspicion that it is the disease. Although you, you only need a, a blood tube that looks like the one on the screen to do it, you, you know that it has to be thought about a lot for, to come to that. The incidence of prevalence, we know it makes it rare. Those are from data that we've had in Leeds. But um, the, the hemolytic side of PNH, where people need treatment with complement inhibitors, sorry, not put my teeth in this morning, inhibitors, um, is where we see the risk for PNH and meningitis. So it's only if therapy is required um, to manage the, the symptoms of the disease that we then have this risk. It's not the PNH itself. We know that PNH is um, not indicative to one sex, not male or female, it can be split pretty much 50-50. And the peak age of diagnosis is, is in the 40s, but we generally have seen over the years of experience that I've had in all ages. So it is a possibility to happen and it is acquired and not inherited. So um, if we could go to the next slide. The symptoms. We just had one quick question there, Louise. Can I just yeah, insert I it? Read it, it, it went says, <laughs> yeah, it says if the average age for diagnosis is 40 to 49, are there many like my daughter has been diagnosed this year and she's 13? Um, so maybe we could list that as something that you might come to or? Do you want to yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I can say that they, they focus on the diagnosis of being more common in the age group of 40 to 49, but it can happen to anyone at any age. Um, there aren't large numbers in any age group because of um, the nature of it being so rare. 
However, as time goes on, and because the therapy has been so successful, there are more people in age groups as you go up, but it's more um, prominent that we've seen a diagnosis around 40 in the 40s. So there are other patients that are, are, are paediatric in 13 that have had that diagnosis, but there's not great numbers, no, but then across the board with the rarity of the disease. I hope that supports a bit, and I'm happy to, to take that up separately to this. Um, so the background of PNH, the symptoms, as we know, are in, are in an array of different symptoms. I've just posted them there, and they are lifelong. But what do we do to manage those symptoms? We see a treatment that's come along, but also it depends on the clone size. So if someone has a PNH clone, like I say, only 8% of those are tend to be hemolytic PNH that requires treatment. But there can still be some symptoms, but it's getting that right and where we place treatment. For that, we have a treatment criteria, which is on the, the National Service website, but we can talk about that a little bit more if anyone has any questions. But also treating someone is unique to the individual and getting that right. So in the current world, we have um, three treatments. If you can see there, the Soliris, Ultimiris and Aspavelli or Empavelli. If you're American, I did some education the other day with some Americans. No one knew what I was talking about, so called it Aspavelli, which is the newer agent on the market but also there is some others that are in clinical trial which obviously we don't name in this setting but those all of those drugs come along and block complement so i thought today we'd talk a little bit about how it blocks complement and why that gives us the issue that we have there are the unmet needs and today i'm not talking so much about how we manage pnh and the symptoms of the disease itself it's just more about specifics of the patients that have had complement inhibition and that risk that comes alongside it the supportive care and the understanding of all that is so vital within this. So if we move on to the next slide, trying to understand complement, even after 20 plus years of being in this arena, for, for me has been a challenge. <laughs> and, and I'm not trying to um, sort of go any deep detail of that, but I think if we can sort of tackle that a little bit, it helps us understand it. And, um, and, and think about it a little bit more. But the thing that we focus on is often that we've talked about someone having an immune attack, which is caused bone marrow failure, which then has given opportunity for the arising of PNH within the system. However, there is more parts to the immune system. The immune system can be quite complex, but if we try and break it down to make it more simple, the complement system is part of your immune system that triggers when there's something foreign comes into the system. So like a measles or a bacteria or something like that, your, your complement fires off bullets to try and get rid of that. So obviously that helps the immune system keep you fit and well. And that works in a way that complements the immune system, which is why it's called complement. But it's also the way I understand it in my mind, and I'm no scientist in the sense of the, 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 the guy that gave a lecture the other week that I listened to, his science on the complement system, he talked for over an hour and he said he'd still talk for another hour. But to get that brief understanding of it, it is just, and Dr. Kelly taught me this many years ago, it's like a set of dominoes. So once that bacteria or something foreign comes into the system, it's like a set of dominoes that triggers off and each one falls down as it goes along. And that's important to remember in, in the sense of how complement inhibition works, because obviously we're affecting that domino effect. So if we go to the next slide. That is a picture of the dominoes in a more scientific way. I don't want to get into all that, but I think it just gives us the basis to think about it. So complement in itself is C1 to C9. So that's our dominoes. And as they tr get triggered, they go like that. When we inhibit complement with the complement inhibition, it is at C5 or C3. Now in clinical trials, there's slightly more about that, but we're not going to get bogged down in that too much today. But for the for the want of this and the, the drugs that may be given, Aspavelli, um, the Pegsetica plan is at C3, the others are at C5, the Revelizumab or the Ultimiris and Soliris or Eclizumab. So why is this important so when we look at that set of dominoes the last part of the set of dominoes is where there is a risk of um, meningitis because that part of the complement fights um, meningococcal infections so the rest of it is um, all working and functioning but also the reason we're blocking that is where you're missing some proteins in pnh or have some things that are not quite right with the blood with the pnh blood cells if that complement is not activated, that last part of it, then you are protecting your blood cells. 
I hope I haven't lost you on that and that makes sense. So if you look at the diagram and be a scientist for a moment, you can see from the top, you've got the C1 down to C5 where we're blocking it. And then it's the last part that's not there. So that, if we block that, stops you having issues and that, that lead to the symptoms of the disease, but also um, puts you at slight increased risk of meningitis. The slight increased risk, we looked at the data very recently, and you'd have to live for 400 years to have the risk of infection. We might change your view on that a little bit by talking to our guest today, but it um, is very, very unlikely. And I do not want anyone to walk away from today thinking, oh my God, this is a massive increased risk. It is not. It's just to be aware of that there is a slightly increased risk to the general population. I went to do the slide then. Can we move to the next slide, please? So looking at generalized data for meningitis for the general population is exactly the same as what we would look at within the setting of PNH. Um, and it is an inflammation around the membranes that surround the brain and the spinal cord. So it is something that's serious. Um, and with the bacterial side of it, it can cause septicemia, as we call it, um, or sepsis, which is more common um, blood poisoning, which is something that we have to deal with straight away and, and address. It's something that can be managed and it can be treated, but it has to be very, very quickly. So if we move on to the next slide. What are the early symptoms um, that we would expect to see? Now, for the general population, early symptoms include fever, headache, vomiting, muscle pain, um, cold hands and feet, and um, the situation can escalate very quickly. In the setting of PNH, it's no different. But in my experience of people having um, meningitis bug in um, the setting of PNH, it's generally presented with a very bad headache um, and a high temperature very suddenly. And I think it's trust your instincts. You know when you feel different. And, and, and I think the important thing from us as a, a service is, is and any um, medical professional is, is if there's a feeling of unwellness or a change in your symptoms or the change from the normal that you, you react to that and, and it would rather you reacted and it was nothing than reacted and didn't react and there was a problem. So we can move to the next slide. So the risk in complement inhibitors or the drugs that we just mentioned is, is addressed very clearly by um, the practice that we have. And to mitigate the, those um, issues that we've seen, we are, are proactive in doing that from the start. So from the moment that the drug is introduced as a possibility, there should be a discussion around this risk being there and how we manage that. And the, the, comp, the kind of... Um, alternative sort of view of it is also understanding that you know that risk is like I say one in 400 years but also a something that is important to um, be understood but it is not a reason not to have therapy um, but you need to feel comfortable with that so we manage it by vaccinations and prophylactic antibiotics also the most important thing is sessions like this or the information that you're given in clinic and the safety card or things like that and i know we we've, we've got a discussion on going outside of this meeting around how we um increase the knowledge or way of sharing that information other than just patient safety cards with bracelets or uh, key rings and different things like that that's ongoing and we hope to address that over the next six months and see if we can make that more robust and um, working alongside people's suggestions and ideas but also as a national service anyone in the uk who has um um complement inhibition also has access to a, a hematology specialist that understands the disease and the treatment which can support anything like that and we'll talk a little bit about that with um, Joby when we get to that point so when i was speaking to maria and the gang before we did put this presentation together she, she said there was an interest from the group as well about understanding what the vaccinations were and how they work and different things like that so i thought i'd go through those a little bit more so if we go to the next slide So on the guidance for giving this therapy, um, it says to give vaccinations 14 days before um, therapy, but generally we give them on day one or day zero. Some people may have had them in advance and um, some people would have had them on day one. Standard practice in the UK now is to give them on day one, unless there's an indication to hold off until a bit later. So we tend to use for the um, most common strains of um, 
meningitis is B in the UK, but we also vaccinate against ACWY and the same as you would with youngsters um, in general population. For that, we use a drug called Memvio, or more recently, a lot more Nimerix. Nimerix has been more available, so it's what is there when we prescribe it. It's a dose of 0.5 mils, and it should be given intramuscular for the best reactions. Sometimes some of you would have experienced having it slightly shallower as a subcutaneous just because of platelet levels due to the bone marrow failure, but ultimately it is a deep muscle vest um, injection. How do we manage that? We do blood teeters. So a lot of you will know we send out boxes from Leeds or you'll be done um, via couriers and stuff through your home care nurses often with um, London. So the blood tests go out to the meningitis reference centre up in London, at Manchester. Um, and we monitor those yearly. And we revaccinate uh, due to loss of response. Um, sometimes we have to revaccinate at the start of a clinical trial to give a boost. And some people will have a partial or non-response. And we generally inform you if that's the case. I have had patients that have um, been having their blood teeters monitors every year since we started doing that and have never needed revaccination. Other patients will need a revaccination once every year, two or three years. And there's no rhyme or reason to that. And I've had endless discussions around vaccinations and even more so in the last few years. We won't get into that today. But um, you know that, that is just human nature and how the, the world of vaccines work. So I thought I'd put a little picture of them. They might look slightly different to the ones on the picture, but that, that is the basic thing. And it just helps you when you know. At the moment, the meningitis reference lab has told us that men A is not um, present in the UK and that we don't need to vaccinate against it. So we don't always monitor for the teeter anymore. However, we are still giving the vaccination because it's all combined into one. But that's, that's just as a point of interest kind of thing I, as a patient, would like to know. So if we move to the other vaccination that we give um, against meningitis, it's meningitis B. So if we move to the next slide, please, Maria. So Betsero, that came onto the market about six, seven years ago. Um, and that, like I say, is the most prominent. We've seen a reduction in the general population since this has come on and it's been given to all small people. Um, it's very similar. It's a dose of 0.5 and it's intramuscular. Um, th there's a lot of debate around this one at the moment because children have it without any issue that we've seen, but we have seen in PNH a little bit more of a reaction to it when we've given it to our gang. Um, we kind of advocate um, that patients have paracetamol before and after, and if there is any concerns, to have that discussion around it. Sometimes we've given a little bit of extra complement inhibition, and there has been a little bit of um, difficulty with it, but it's not a reason not to have it, and um, that has been a nervousness around that, which is why we don't state it as a, as a thing. It, it is something that should be given in the same way as all the discussions around vaccines at the moment. Blood teeters are not possible to monitor the response to this due to the fact that it um, um, doesn't work in the tube when you try and, and do that test. So we give two doses initially about six weeks apart and then a boost is given about five yearly. Sometimes it's three yearly in the younger. And like I say, we, we, we give paras offer the advice of giving paracetamol before and after. For some of you that are on um, the Aspervelli, the newer treatment for the C3 inhibition, there are a couple of other vaccinations that come alongside that, but I just thought I'd mention that to Kurt today, um, that there is more than just those two. But that is um, the focus for the complement inhibitions at C5 is those two vaccinations. But generally, like I say, they're done on day one. The reason that we then give antibiotics is to support those um, vaccinations. If we move to the next slide, so endless conversations with Ray Borrow at the lab in the Public Health um, Meningitis Reference Centre, and he says this is the most important part of it. And that's taken a bit of time to understand and get our heads around. And if you think, we we'll go back to the, the, the fact that the incidence and prevalence is a very rare disease, and then we've had a treatment that's not been on the market that long, although it feels like a, 20 years is a while, it is still a bit of understanding there. But we give preventative antibiotics alongside and he says he can't stress enough how important that is for someone to take those. Obviously there is exceptions to the rule and no one um, is perfect and sometimes it causes problems especially for ladies with thrush and other people with upset stomachs and that you know we persevere sometimes it, but sometimes it's just not something that's possible and that's where we come on to the rescue antibiotics but the preventative antibiotics we give so if the vaccinations have been given on day zero of complement inhibition, we give ciprofloxacin um, for 
500 milligrams twice a day. It's a slightly higher dose than some other prophylactic programs, but that's to try and get it into the nasal cavity. Um, and that is for 14 days. So that's like a treatment dose. That's that. And then it's followed up with a prophylactic supported dose of penicillin V 500 twice a day or erythromycin if someone is allergic to penicillin. Yeah, there is some nervousness around that. Um, taking antibody from everybody and I think that's natural and I think as human nature we need to question that and we need to be our own advocates but long-term use of that has not proven to be a problem or cause more issues but it's something that um, has been seen as, as very helpful in preventing infections. The pictures I put there don't take as gospel they were just examples from the internet. <laughs> Every hospital on a different day will have a different box because of the way it's supplied but I just thought it's, it gives it a little bit of visual doesn't it? So if we move on swiftly before we run out of time. So the rescue antibiotics were something that have been there and then taken away and then reintroduced. So we give a couple of doses of ciprofloxacin as a 500. So if you have symptoms or you're concerned or you're struggling to get to hospital or um, anything like that, you can take it. But I do say that the most important thing is to um, ask a healthcare professional as well. Don't hesitate in taking it, but do just still get in touch with someone. Don't use it as a treatment. In Leeds over the pandemic, an emergency pack was increased to a longer period of time because it was a big anxiety for some of the consultants around keeping people out of hospital in the, the height of the pandemic um, due to the immunosuppression and different things and avoiding the other virus that was um, frightening us all. So um, there is slight differences between that practice. In London, they felt that that was different because of the access to the hospital. So that wasn't introduced. It was just the, the two day scenario. So I hope that's clear from, from that point of view. Um, and if we move to the next slide. Most importantly, I think it's the understanding. There is a small increased risk. If you have an infection like a temperature, a headache or feeling well, um, or you feel different to normal, you're the expert you know, just react to it. Um, surround yourself also with people that understand that, that can react to you. I know I was unwell with an infection uh, a year or so ago and I made no sense to it, my husband and people around me, and I um, didn't seek the possibly the care I needed but because as a healthcare professional everyone was like oh she'll be all right but actually you know you need to surround the people with the stubborn people that will guide you to getting some help and that's take it from me is important um, and take the rescue antibiotics if indicated but still communicate so if we go to the next slide um, I think we've kind of covered that but tell the doctors and nurses to me is the most important that you are on a complement inhibitor and that you have a diagnosis of PNH. Contact the, the National Service if you can or a haematologist or anyone that may have that understanding if you're not able to get that message across. So I'd like to move on so we don't run out of time um, and thank you for listening to that. To the next one, move over from the conclusion. Oh, we can leave that on the screen. So I'd like to introduce you to someone who um, is very special to me, but uh, as in any patient, but I think to do this today is very, very brave um, and, and special. We, we have had experience with nine cases of meningitis in the National Service um, in Leeds and a couple in London. And one of the people that's had that is Javita. And Javita, I'd like to, you to introduce yourself a little bit today um, and share your story to reassure, and but also just help understanding in a way that I cannot. Hi, um, I'm Joby. I'm 24 years old. I was diagnosed in 2016 with PNH. And um, so I was 17 years old and in my last year of school. Um, and I have just finished my master's in bioarchaeology and I'm now working in research at the University of Aberdeen. So after your diagnosis of PNH, um, and I remember it well, that you, you were um, offered to start on complement inhibition. Which one did you start on and what else did you have at the time? I started on Solaris or Ecolizumab and when I started on that, I was vaccinated against meningitis and I was given, um, well, I was prescribed penicillin to take daily, which I did. Um, brilliant. And, and, and um, did you feel that you had education and support around that at the time? Yeah, definitely. I was, I was told about the um, risk of meningitis 
and because I was going to be starting university that year I really took it upon myself to learn the symptoms and and know what to look out for because I know that meningitis is more prominent in student populations as well so I just wanted to to make sure I could be as safe as possible Brilliant. And, and I was given a warning card as well yeah safety card yeah, yeah. and that, that that is sort of um, something that um, is significant in that way you had in experience with infection in, in a way that I think is um, unusual in the sense that you have had it twice um, but if you're happy to share us a little bit about what you experienced when you did have infection um, I think it helps understanding yeah um, so when I was in my second year of uni um, I it was right at the start of of term and I suddenly started feeling unwell and I had contracted meningococcal sepsis um, so I was admitted to hospital and was there for about two weeks and was treated um, with antibiotics there and that was quite horrible and then but I recovered from that and went back to uni. And then in the summer of 2020, during lockdown, I contracted meningitis again, or meningococcal sepsis, um, which this time was quite a lot worse and it had progressed to septic shock. Um, so I had spent another two weeks in hospital, including um, a few days in the ICU. Um, and yeah, I had been shielding for six weeks at that point and hadn't seen anyone but my household members and um, and my healthcare nurses. So, yeah, I still managed to get it. <laughs> do, you, do you think that affected how you responded to it? Because you didn't expect that. Yeah, it definitely took longer to get to the hospital that time um, because of covid and everything not knowing exactly what to do and i also was surprised um for it to happen again um mm -hmm. so it did take longer to get to hospital and i think that is definitely why it was worse that time around yeah and i i, I don't want to um pry too much but I, and thank you for for sharing that so much in, in the sense of your first symptom was it a headache or was it just feeling generally unwell it started off both times with a headache um actually both times were very early in the morning um so i woke up because of a bad headache and i was cold and 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 um shivering and so it was very subtle i didn't really think much of it and then um i started to get back pain and then it wasn't until i started being sick that i was like oh okay actually this is this is bad i need to um get this checked out and um yeah and as you mentioned before as well cold hands and cold feet headaches um high temperature all of that really mm -hmm. but it is subtle start and i was it took a while to kind of figure out what it was for me yeah well i can't thank you enough for sharing that and um it's so good to hear how well you've recovered um, do you continue on a compliment inhibitor? <laughs> Sorry, I can say it today. <laughs> I do. Um, I, after both of them, I continued on eclizumab and then I've been on ravaluzumab for the past almost year and a half. Brilliant, brilliant. And um, is there any anything you would want to share about those experiences of what they've taught you? Um, or Yes. Uh, my experiences have taught me so much about what to do and expect with meningococcal diseases. Um, my main advice to other PNH patients um, would be to know the symptoms. Um, knowing the symptoms of both meningitis and meningococcal sepsis um, could just save your life. Um, there are different symptoms for both, so I'd make sure to learn both. Um, if I hadn't known them, I might not have got to the hospital in time and that saved my life knowing them um not everyone presents with the same symptoms um and as i said it can be very very subtle to start um there i'd also say what's really important is to act fast 
again, as Louise said, just it can progress very, very quickly. And so if you know the symptoms and you can act fast, then it can make such a difference. Um, my parents had kept in their heads that if I had been told I, if I was unwell and developed a temperature, I should go straight to hospital. And so they really helped me with that as well. Um, also carry a warning card or something similar. After my second time with meningitis, I got myself a, um, a medical bracelet, um, which just gives me a bit of peace of mind. Um, because delirium and confusion is a symptom. So I want to know that if it happens again, other people around me can sort me out if I can't sort myself out. And I think it's also important to understand that the vaccines, although they significantly lower the risk, they don't provide 100% protection. I have been vaccinated multiple times now and I've still had it twice. Um, I, during the pandemic, when I got sick, I really, really ran myself down because I was writing my undergrad dissertation. And I think because I wasn't looking after myself, my body just wasn't able to fight off the infection. Um, the strain I had then was a was usually non-pathogenic, but I just think I'd run myself down so much that my body couldn't fight it off. So my advice would be just try and keep yourself as healthy as possible. Don't let yourself get to that position. And um, don't play it down. I played it down to the doctors when I got to the hospital because I just didn't realize how serious it was. And they almost ruled it out um, because I didn't describe it as bad as it was. Um, so yeah, as, as Louise has said, if you're feeling unwell, and suspect meningitis, just act fast, take your cipro, ciprofloxacin and make sure you contact your, your medical team. That's my advice. Thank you, Jovi. I, I can't thank you enough for sharing that and, and I know how, how much that means to everybody, but I also think that it's exceptionally hard sometimes to talk about ourselves, especially in this platform. Um, it's sometimes easier face to face, but even then it, it's a massive thing. And I'm, I'm just so pleased to, to see you um, being willing to do that, but also, um, you know, that you're continuing to be well and, and you've been so successful and, and did pass your undergraduate as well. <laughs> so well done on that front. But uh, and, and I think the key, key thing is, is that I've given you the practical side, but the real education is there in, in, in what Jovi says. and. Um, I, I can't express that enough, but I think also to take away where we started is that the risk is slightly increased um, and, you know, the advice is the same in the general population, but obviously if it does happen that, that one does respond to it, the difference is, is communicating that there is that underlying condition and treatment that may make it something that's a little bit different in that presentation. 